when we when we left the other day, um, I was trying to point out a couple of things to you. Uh, one, uh, well, actually, they're both going to be uh, important to the final exam questions. Um, so when you find yourself preparing, For those final exam questions, uh, you'll come across this. What, what is the phrase that I use? I mean, the four propositions. Oh, page forty-nine. Page forty-nine, right? Uh, and so, I mean, those those four propositions. I don't know that we need necessarily to go through them at this point, uh, but um, I, I will say that. Well, I mean, maybe we should. So the first proposition is that the grounds upon which this, I mean, this is in scare quotes, right? This world has been designated as a parent, uh, establish, wait, sorry. The grounds upon which this world has been designated as a parent establish rather its reality. Another kind of reality is absolutely undemonstrable. I mean, another kind of reality cannot be demonstrated despite what Plato says. The second proposition, the characteristics which have been assigned to the real being, in scare quotes, of things are the characteristics of non-being, of nothingness. The real world has been constructed out of the contradiction to the actual world, an apparent world indeed, insofar as it is no more than a moral optical illusion. So what he's saying here is that, uh, let me see if I can say this succinctly. In talking about this moral optical illusion, we have posited this so-called real world that exists apart from the world that we're, do, that we're trafficking in, that we're doing commerce in, right? We have posited this other, this real world uh, for the sake of wagging our moralistic finger at ourselves and at each other. This is the claim. The third proposition. To talk about another world than this is quite pointless, provided that an instinct for slandering, disparaging, and accusing life is not strong within us. In the latter case, we revenge ourselves on life by means of the phantasmagoria of another, a better life. Now, this is basically explaining, the third proposition is basically an explanation of the second proposition. Right, a more careful, I mean, get, I guess, kind of construction of it. And then the fourth proposition, to divide the world into a real and an apparent world, whether in the manner of Christianity or in the manner of Kant, which is, after all, that of a cunning Christian, uh, is only a suggestion of decadence, a symptom of declining life. That the artist places a higher value on appearance than on reality constitutes no objection to this proposition, for appearance here signifies reality once more, only selected, strengthened, corrected. The tragic artist is not a pessimist. It is precisely he who affirms all that is questionable and terrible in existence in his uh, he is Dionysian. Um, so all of that is basically, I, I think you could read these four propositions as kind of what Nietzsche is trying to claim about, about uh, Socrates, about what the problem of Plato and Socrates really is. And so, I mean, we're still with this, we're still dealing with these old situations with Nietzsche that you were dealing with in the second paper, uh, uh, basically where he's trying to argue that, you know, why is it really that we have set this kind of other life? What would, what would motivate people to, to have to set another life? And the only kind of answer that's going to counter that is going to, uh, I guess, be meaningful to us is a psychological motivation, right? So this psychological motivation that, that drives us to posit this other, more real world than the one that we, that we occupy, uh, uh, for Nietzsche, I think, is, I mean, the only answer for Nietzsche is that we do it so that we can shame ourselves. Why do we need to feel ashamed?
That's, that really is a kind of denial of life. I mean, it's a negation of life. So, enough about that. Now, if you look at the, how the real world at last became a myth, and I gave you these um, uh, points here. Uh, that, uh, basically, what I, what I was giving you at the end of class the other day was um, kind of how to understand each one, each step of the history of an error. So, the first step, where he says the real world attainable to the wise, the pious, the virtuous man. He dwells in it. He is it. Uh, basically is talking about uh, uh, the world that was uh, th- that Plato was reacting to. Oldest form of the idea, relatively sensible, simple, convincing, transcription of the proposition, I, Plato, am the truth. I mean, this is what he's, uh, what he's doing here. And I said that this refers to Platonic dualism. That that's what he's talking about there. So that's the first step. The second step, the real world unattainable for the moment, but promised to the wise, the pious, the virtuous man, to the sinner who repents, uh, uh, is uh, Christianity. The Christianizing of Plato. Plato for the masses, I guess. Uh, so... Uh, here, the, the real world is attainable by he who repents, right? So having, having already accepted, right, the, the, that only the wise, I mean, get, uh, get to the real world. Now, uh, it's not only the wise, it's those who repent, I mean, get to the real world. And so there's some sort of relationship now between repentance or between penance and wisdom. Okay, the third step in this historical development uh, refers to Kantian dualism. This is what I felt like I needed to say something about. In that previous section that we were talking about, he said he, he refers to Kant as having been, after all, only a cunning Christian, right? That uh, so this Kantian dualism that's being referred to, Kant understood the world. Uh, as, uh, well, he makes this phenomenal noumenal distinction uh, where phenomena refers to appearance and noumena refers to the world as it is in itself. Uh, the German it is the Ding on Zish. You'll see this in your readings sometimes. The Ding on Zish. Uh, and basically, what Kant uh, showed is that we always encounter the world through an appearance. Right? Uh, but that world that we're encountering through an appearance, is a world as it is in itself. Now, we have to, because our, because our ability to reason is structured uh, the way that it's structured, we have to assume that there is such a world as it is in itself. Even though we never, for so long as we're alive, have any direct access to it. It's always, I mean, our perception, our perspective on it, our perception of it is always mediated through an appearance, through a phenomenon, I mean, as, he's, as he's calling it. Uh, um, well, what this does is it sets up, I mean, you can see how this is connected to Plato in a lot of ways, except that, except that Kant is now saying that it's our, the, what, what does he call this, the, uh, um, the manifold, Right, that exists up here in our heads, right, in our perceptual abilities, in our ability to have experience, right? Uh, it, 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 that that this thinking of the world in this way is a requirement of our ability to reason, right? And this opens up the possibility of things like uh, time, space, 
and cause and effect being something that we bring to the occasion that don't really exist in the world or might not really exist in the world as it is in itself. Right? It's because our brains are so structured as to have to see the world in that way. Okay? All right. So, uh, so Kantian dualism re- refers to, I mean, the dualism itself is the phenomena and the thing in itself. The thing in itself now is, is nothing but a posit. I mean, it's nothing but something that we, because of our reasoning ability, must assume there to be. So it's moved into a more scientific kind of <laughs> uh, description. And then it gets even more scientific in the next step for positivism. This is pure you know, science. Uh, a hidden world now, this noumenal world of Kant's, is, is no longer relevant. The, you know, what Plato referred to as real world. While it may exist, and, and it may be, you know, in the form of noumena, uh, is irrelevant. Fifth um, is we we then therefore reject the real real world. Now this is reactive nihilism, the pure form. There is no real world. There is no reality. And then what ends up happening is that we're forced to reject dualism. All dualisms. And when we do that, we're at a uh, a, a, a spot of creative or active nihilism. It's kind of here, or this is the um, crucible, I guess, I mean, through which we pass to freedom for him. So the idea, I mean, is that once we have rejected dualism, right here, once we have rejected these kind of binary oppositions of real and apparent, sinner and saint, once we've rejected all of these dualisms, then we abolish this notion of the apparent world and the real world. So the very idea of a real world is meaningless now. And the idea of this world, if if the idea of a real world is meaningless, then the idea of an apparent world is meaningless. Right? So now we've abolished the dualism. And so we're left with one world, which must have been where we began before Platonic dualism. Okay? All right, so that's the history of the error that I wanted to get get out there. Did we talk about or earlier, I mean, uh, about Kant's categorical imperative? I asked you to be sure to remember this, I think. Uh, right, that Kant's categorical imperative uh, was that uh, uh, I should act only on that maxim that I would at the same time will to be a universal law. Uh-huh. Right? Do you remember that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Keep, I mean, keep, like, study that, read that again. Uh, uh, you, you might need it soon. Um, okay. I should act only on that maxim that I would at the same time will to be a universal law. Uh, that, it turns out, for Kant, I mean, is a demand of reason. Right? That's something that is perfectly rationally justifiable. So, all right, that, all right, that's not really connected to this Nietzsche business, but I wanted to make sure that while we're on the subject of Kant that you understand that. Okay.